Dateline, Ogden Daily Standard, February 1st, 1894. A curious letter handed to a legislator while visiting the Utah Insane Asylum. Quote, Utah citizens, you have not the right to keep a stranger as a prisoner in an insane asylum while he has all his sense and was never in his life crazy. If the territory of Utah has no use for me, let them bring me over to the frontier in Colorado. I have friends that will give me a chance to make an honest living. If the great American Republic has no use for me, I pray the democratic government to do me justice by sending me out of this country to Canada. I hope to be welcomed there. 14 years ago, I took the shilling of an agent of Queen Victoria in London, England, and pledged myself to serve the interests of Great Britain. Signed, Paul Sano of Russia. Utah Territorial Insane Asylum, January 1894. End quote. I'm Wendy. This is Demolish Salt Lake and the story of the Territorial Insane Asylum. Hello and welcome to episode 10 and the second episode of our summer road trip series. We are headed about 45 miles south of Salt Lake City to Provo, Utah, specifically to 1300 East Center Street and the current location of the Utah State Hospital. Back in 1885, this was known as the Territorial Insane Asylum. This is one of two insane asylums built in Utah. Yes, private and county hospitals had wards designated for those with mental illnesses, but there were only two hospitals specifically built to care for those deemed insane and committed to a hospital. Asylums are one of my favorite historic buildings. The thought process put into the designs of the building and the architecture itself to me is just amazing. The original buildings of this hospital are no exception. All right. Let's get on the road. Now, before we head to Provo, we're going to start in Salt Lake City in 1869, when the Salt Lake City Council approved an ordinance to build a city of sane asylum and hospital to, quote, establish a place for the use and treatment of the sick, also for the treatment and safekeeping of insane and idiotic persons, end quote. A 160-acre site was chosen at 12th East and 9th South. Unfortunately, there isn't a complete story to this first asylum. Theodore McKean, a city council member and former sheriff, was the first superintendent, and Jeter Clinton was the physician. In a quarterly report to the city council in the fall of 1874, McKean reported that as of September 30th, 1874, four patients had been discharged, one died, and 10 patients remained, three males and seven females. Despite this established asylum, in January of 1872, Governor George L. Woods spoke to the Legislative Assembly of the need for an insane asylum. This was echoed by Governor George W. Emery in January of 1876, when he stated to the Legislative Assembly that, quote, we need a territorial asylum for the insane, which will afford this class of unfortunate people proper treatment at the public's expense unless they are possessed of sufficient means to defray the necessary changes attending their care. Such an institution is indispensable in every state and territory and should be under the control of a skillful physician who has had experience in treating this class of patients. Humanity and wise government alike seem to require of us such a provision and I suggest some action be taken by you looking to the establishment of such an institution, even if it be on a limited scale, though adequate to the present wants of our people, end quote. In March 1876, the city council advised closing the current asylum in Salt Lake City due to its financial problems. Enter Dr. Seymour B. Young, who proposed to take over the institution. In 1876, with a payment to the city in the amount of $5,000, the asylum became privately owned and operated by Dr. Young. Often referred to as the White House on the Hill, a report in the Salt Lake Tribune from November 1884 stated, quote, 29 inmates, of which 15 are men and 14 women, at different stages of insanity are here confined for treatment some at the expense of relatives and friends, and others at the expense of the county. 
It must be admitted that everything was found in good condition as circumstances would allow, and as possibly could be expected. The location of the asylum is very desirable and healthy, being situated at the foot of the Wasatch Mountains and having a commanding view of Salt Lake Valley, the lake, and distant mountains. It is surrounded by a fine orchard and gardens. The interior of the two story building was found in very satisfactory condition. The patients were clean and well provided with clothing and bedding. The food was good and seemed to be sufficiently distributed to judge from the healthy appearance of all patients. End quote. Despite this favorable report, the asylum was later described as a den fit for wild beasts and one of the vilest institutions of its kind. Now we'll come back to Dr. Young's asylum in a bit. In 1880, an act to establish a territorial insane asylum was approved, and an appropriation of $25,000 was made. A board of directors was convened, and after considering Salt Lake, Davis, Utah, and Weber counties as places for the new institution, the board selected a site one and a quarter miles due east from the courthouse in Provo, Utah. Of course, the board put a positive spin on this site, promoting it as having excellent water facilities away from the noise of the city and quality grounds for agriculture and horticulture. In reality, it was chosen for its isolation. Much of the surrounding land consisted of swamps and the city trash dump. The truth is, no one wanted an insane asylum anywhere near where they lived or worked. This wasn't just in Provo. This was all over the country. Asylums were built on the outskirts of town or miles from civilization. With a location and funding secured, John H. Burton was appointed as architect. Burton was also the architect for the Tribune Building at 137 South Main Street. When Burton passed away in 1887, Richard Cletting took over the task of lead architect. We have him to thank for the Utah State Capitol Building, the original Saltaire Pavilion, four buildings on President Circle at the University of Utah, and the McIntyre Building in downtown Salt Lake, just to name a few. Construction on the first building began in 1882. In the meantime, patients were sent to Dr. Young's Asylum in Salt Lake. On July 15, 1885, the Territorial Insane Asylum was open to much fanfare. The ceremonies were attended by Governor Murray, local and state government officials, LDS church officials, doctors, nurses, and the general public. In addition to speeches, there was also music and refreshments. An article in the Salt Lake Democrat dated July 16, 1885 with the headline, Formal opening of this fine institution for the care of the demented read in part, quote, The present completed wing, or rather half wing, is in an L shape with a west frontage of 150 feet and one to the south of 108 feet, comprising about one fifth of the entire building planned and has cost to date nearly $100,000. The building is three stories and a basement and comprised of 148 rooms. The basement will be used for attendance quarters, stewards and matrons departments, kitchens, etc. The upper stories will be for the use of inmates. The west front of each story is divided into wards, and fronting the south are the hospital wards, dining rooms, sitting rooms, bathrooms, and closets. The wide corridors and high ceilings give the rooms a cool air and light and healthy appearance. Elevators run from the basement to the top story. As near as possible, the structure has been made fireproof. The floors are of noted Georgia pine, the walls are hard finished, and every arrangement is at hand to quench a fire in its infancy. The engine room and laundry room are located to the northeast of the main building, end quote. So as noted from this article, this building was only a portion of the larger building to be completed. Eventually, this would become the South Wing. The North Wing was completed in 1890, and the next year, the front and center portion was built. Once completed, this became the 31,100-square-foot administration building, which was the main building for the entire hospital. The front and center portion of the building was built in the Gothic style, with walls made of sandstone and pressed brick. The main entrance was built entirely of stone and had 27 steps leading to a porch and the entrance doors. It was four stories with a basement, attic, two towers, each with a cupola. This was used for administration purposes. Looking at the Sanborn Fire Insurance Map from 1890, 
Both the north and the south wings of the building were connected to the administration portion and to each other by corridors. The north wing housed men and the south wing housed females. In a separate building attached to the corridors were the bakery, kitchen, chapel, laundry, coal shed, engine room, and workshop. In 1902, with the need for expansion, the institution adopted the cottage plan style of asylum planning. This style was popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s at asylums across the country. The plan incorporated multiple buildings across the campus to house specific patients and activities. In a cottage plan, typically an administration building was located at the front of the campus with patient buildings surrounding it. Power plants, laundry facilities, and farms were often located in the rear of the campus. Often the buildings were connected by a series of tunnels to not only provide heat to the buildings, but also to allow patients and service personnel to travel from building to building. There is another style of asylum planning I want to mention, and this is the Kirkbride plan. This plan was designed by Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride, fashionably known as Kirkbrides. This is my absolute favorite style of building ever. Dr. Kirkbride kept treatment and healing of patients in mind when he conceptualized this design. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked talking about this, so instead, I will recommend that you listen to episode 373, The Kirkbride Plan, of the 99% Invisible podcast to learn more about Dr. Kirkbride and this incredible style of building. All right, so with the cottage plan in place, Two small, one-story, single-word buildings intended to hold about 30 patients were built. These would come to be known as Wards 9 and 10. The two-story Milton Hardy building was erected in 1908. The George Hyde building was completed in 1922, and the Frederick Dunn building in 1932. These were three-story buildings with six wards in each. The rapid expansion of the institution reflected just how overcrowded the hospital had become over the years. More on that to come. Now, back when the asylum opened in 1885, 15 patients were transferred from Dr. Young's asylum in one day. And this essentially closed that institution after about 15 years. So how did a person end up in the asylum? Well, voluntary commitment patients were admitted but court commitment was the most common way of admission. If you remember back to episode five in the Salt Lake County General Hospital, I mentioned that hospital had a holding facility for involuntary patients waiting for their court appearance. Anyone who wanted someone committed filled out a form and went before a district judge. If the judge found reasonable cause for commitment, a commitment hearing was scheduled. Commitment hearings were held weekly, During a hearing, the judge had two practicing physicians certify under oath whether or not the person was insane. The judge made the decision to commit on the spot after only a few minutes. Then the case was closed and the next commitment hearing began. There were various reasons for commitment. Some examples are hysteria, mental excitement, political excitement, nerves, death of a family member, domestic trouble, excitement, masturbation, feebleness, melancholy, religious enthusiasm, alcoholism, depression, and syphilis. Others were committed due to epilepsy and physical and cognitive disabilities. When it came right down to it, the reasons for commitments were just all over the place. Insane asylums across the country were places where people unable to fit into society were dumped and forgotten. The territorial insane asylum was no different. Let me give you some examples of commitments as told through newspaper articles from the Salt Lake Herald Republican. His first article is dated March 2nd, 1893. Quote, Probate Judge Blair rendered his decision yesterday afternoon in the matter of the sanity of W.F. Altridge, whose prosperity for forging checks had caused his family much concern and expense for several years past. He adjudged the boy insane and ordered him sent to the asylum at Provo, end quote. Here's an article from May 25, 1900, quote, George Harrison, aged 15, and Mrs. Martha McCluskey, aged 85, both of Bountiful, were today examined as to their sanity by Dr. Stringham and Gleason, before Deputy Clerk Palmer, and both were adjudged insane 
and orders committing them to the asylum were signed. The young man has but recently became dangerously insane. Mrs. McCluskey has been afflicted for years and frequently wandered away to Salt Lake City, end quote. And finally, April 27th, 1910, quote, Matko Volano, the giant Italian who terrorized farmers in the southwestern section of the city several days ago and was only captured after a two-day search of the mountains, was today adjudged insane by the Lunacy Commission in the district court and ordered committed to the mental hospital in Provo. Volano believes himself to be followed by a posse of enemies who are bent on taking his life. The local authorities are of the opinion that he is a fugitive from justice and gone insane through the fear of his arrest and the privation of his flight, end quote. Evidence abounds of inhumane treatment of patients in asylums. Over the years, the Territorial Insane Asylum implemented a variety of treatments that were popular at the time. There was the Utica Crib, named after the New York State Lunatic Asylum at Utica, where it was first introduced by its director, Dr. Brigham, in about 1845. The crib was 18 inches deep, 6 feet long, and 3 feet wide. It had slatted sides and a slatted lid that closed with a spring lock. Imagine a coffin with slatted sides and top. There was no room to sit up or turn over. This contraption was used to restrain patients and enforce rest as a way of therapeutic treatment. I had the opportunity to lay in a Utica crib once, and I will tell you that there was nothing therapeutic about it. Even with the slatted sides, it was very claustrophobic and I felt trapped. I can't imagine being locked in one for any longer than the five minutes that I spent in it. And some patients spent hours or even days locked in one. Luckily, these cribs fell out of favor by the early 1900s. Other restraints used were straitjackets, which I also had the opportunity to try on. I didn't even last long enough for the straps to be tightened. <laughs> Unfortunately, straitjackets would continue to be used for a very long time. Then there was the tranquilizer chair, developed by Dr. Benjamin Rush. Dr. Rush believed insanity was an inflammation of the brain, so he designed this chair to confine patients as a way to control blood flow to the brain. A person was strapped to the chair at the chest, abdomen, ankles, and knees, and a wooden box was placed over the head. Believe it or not, this was preferred over the straitjacket. The hospital also had what was referred to as strong rooms, which were basically just jail cells. These housed the violent and criminally insane patients. Hydrotherapy treatment was introduced in 1910. This treatment included saline baths and hot and cold baths. Patients could be immersed in these baths for hours or days at a time, but only allowed out to use the restroom. Needle showers where water was sprayed at patients were used to stimulate lethargic patients. Excited patients were wrapped tightly in wet, cold sheets and restrained to their beds as a way to induce calm. Hydrotherapy at its best only had temporary benefits. In 1934, convulsion therapy was added to the list of treatments at the hospital. Metrazole was given to a patient to induce convulsions. In 1937, insulin shock therapy was added. Patients were given a large dose of insulin to produce a diabetic coma. The object was to keep the patient in an unconscious state for hours to calm restless and agitated patients. 1947 brought electroconvulsive or shock therapy, where a small amount of electricity is passed to the brain to induce a seizure. This was used to treat those with severe depression. By the 1950s, hypoglycemic therapy, electroshock therapy, hydrotherapy, psychoanalyst therapy, group therapy, and medication were all used to treat patients. From what I understand, there is no record of lobotomies performed at the hospital, but I did find an article that stated that over 500 were performed on patients throughout the state of Utah in the 40s. Patient labor was important to the hospital. Patients made tin cans, mattresses, furniture, shoes, clothing, towels, blankets, and a host of other items. Aside from working in the sewing room, they also worked in the laundry, kitchen, boiler house, farm, and dairy. Patients were even involved in the construction of new buildings on the campus up until the 50s. Now, the Territorial Insane Asylum was not immune to the problems of other asylums of the day. It suffered from overcrowding, underfunding, and horrible conditions. 
Wards meant to hold a handful of patients were packed with up to 50. Patients were given one bath per week and had to ask staff for toilet paper, as there were no toilet paper dispensers in the bathrooms. By the 40s, patients were overflowing into the halls. The hospital reached its peak population of 1,351 patients in 1955. A survey of the hospital in 1951 listed capacity at 937. More money was given, which allowed for individual treatment plans and more personal care. In the 70s, the hospital population declined with the introduction of new medications and more community health centers throughout the state. Changes were coming to the old institution, now known as the Utah State Hospital. The administration building, which had gone through a facelift in the 30s to make it less Frankenstein castle-like and more welcoming, was partially demolished in 1976 and completely demolished in 1981 after being declared a fire hazard and structurally unsound. The Hardy Building was demolished in 1967, the Hyde Building in 2004, and the Dunn Building at some point in there as well. In fact, all the original buildings, save for three, are now gone. The three still standing are the Superintendent's Home that houses the Utah State Hospital Museum. And if you have not gone to the museum, please go. It's amazing. The Cottage House and the Recreation Center. Now, about that Recreation Center. It was built between 1936 and 1937. It was one of the few Works Progress administration projects on campus. The other projects were the construction of the superintendent's residence, the facelift on the central portion of the administration building that I had just mentioned, and upgrades to the heating plant. The recreation center consists of 18-tier amphitheater with attached rooms and two two two-story towers on the southeast and northwest corner. It's made almost entirely of stone. The towers and battlements give it that castle look, hence it being known as the castle. It remains historically intact and was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1986. In 1971, the hospital organized a spook alley for staff and patients. It became an annual tradition and every year grew bigger and bigger. A few years later, staff got the idea to make this event into a fundraiser by opening it to the public. The Recreation Center was the perfect location, and patients and staff worked hard every year to build elaborate scenes to scare the bejesus out of attendees. Staff chose patients carefully to make sure they were a good fit and that participating would not interrupt their treatments. Admission was considered a donation, which allowed the hospital to bring in much-needed revenues to help fund recreation programs. This translated into upwards of $125,000 annually. The money was used to take patients on outings and buy things like art supplies and camping gear. All these things got the patients out of the hospital and into a place where they would open up and feel a sense of normalcy. Now, as you can imagine, this event was not without controversy. Some felt it perpetuated the negative stereotypes of patients in mental hospitals and contributed to the public's fear of mental illness. However, the hospital argued they educated the public on the stigma through the popularity of the event. This became quite the heated issue, and it all came to a head in 1998 when the Board of Mental Health, after hearing both sides of the argument, voted to close the haunted castle for good. There is speculation the capital was nearing the end anyway, due to increasing liability issues. In 2000, the state legislature appropriated an additional $76,000 to the hospital to make up the loss of income and keep the recreation programs going. More than 500 patients died at the Territorial Insane Asylum between 1885 and 1960. For 485 of them, a pauper's grave in blocks 5, 7, and 8 at the Provo City Cemetery became their final resting place. The first patient to die in custody was 60-year-old Stuart Kingsburg. He was admitted for being blind, deaf, and helpless. His family requested the hospital take care of his burial, which took place on October 26, 1886. The youngest patient to die at the asylum was 18-month-old Phyllis Joan Templeman. 
Her adopted family returned her to state custody when she was diagnosed with hydrocephalus. She was buried August 3rd, 1931. Mrs. Martha McCluskey, who I spoke about earlier in discussing commitment trials, passed away 19 days after she was committed to the hospital and was buried June 13th, 1900. All these souls were forgotten for years until Janina Chilton, a historian at the Utah State Hospital, painstakingly dug through the records to find the names of all buried in the grave. Through the Forgotten Patient Cemetery Project, money was raised, and in October 2018, a memorial wall with all the names and death dates of the patients was placed on this site. May they all rest in peace. Head over to my Instagram and Facebook pages at Demolish Sully Podcast to see some amazing pictures of the hospital throughout the years. If you're on Twitter, make sure to follow me at Demolished SL Pod. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe. Now, as I've mentioned, I have what some would call an obsession with asylums, specifically ones built in the Kirkbride plan. Today, only a few dozen Kirkbrides are still standing and many are rapidly deteriorating and threatened with demolition. Like any other historic building, Kirkbrides deserve to be preserved, not only for their architecture, but also for their stories and for the chance to have a second life as a contributing building in our communities. Check out thepreservationworks.org to learn more about their mission to preserve the remaining Kirkbrides. Now, I'm a supporter, so yes, this is a shameless plug, but what they're doing is really important for our historic built environment. And if you want to learn more about historic asylums in general throughout the states and the world, check out asylumprojects.org. It's probably the most comprehensive database on asylums you will find. Join me next time as we head to Manti, Utah and the Standard Parachute Factory, where you will meet some of the Rosie the Riveters of Utah. We'll see you then.